And our first speaker this time is, is uh, Gunas Biden. Gunas is a senior researcher at the Department of Engineering Science here in Oxford, and he's also affiliated with the Computer Science Department. He's a research consultant for Microsoft Research in Cambridge and a member of the European Lab for Learning and Intelligent Systems. I think that already makes it clear that Gunas is a person who wears many hats. On the one hand, he's an expert on the methods for automatic differentiation and probabilistic programming. But on the other hand, he's also very interested in applying these techniques and others to concrete problems in the physical sciences. He covers topics ranging from the physics of the sun's magnetic field all the way to the fundamental interactions of the Higgs boson. And of course, evaluating these huge benefits that machine learning can bring to all of these fields is central to this series of seminars. It's central to his work and it's also central to this talk. His contribution today is titled Probabilistic Programming for Inverse Problems in Physical Sciences. So please, Gunesh, take it away when you're ready. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. That's like the best introduction I got. Uh, yeah, so I'm really happy to talk to you today. So the subject is about uh, probabilistic programming, which is like a, uh, one can say it's a subfield of machine learning that handles like generative models where you specify a generative model instead of learning a generative model from data like people do with uh, GANs and flow models and BAEs and other stuff, if you know these. Uh, probabilistic programming is a field where you specify a generative model in, in terms of a uh, uh, like general purpose uh, program. You, you write down your generative model and you do, uh, by doing that, you define a prior distribution and uh, you do like inference by conditioning on data observations and you get posterior distributions over, over, like, over, the, over the random variables that, that you defined in your uh, uh, program. So that's the uh, regular uh, way people do that. So the, the subject in this talk is uh, bringing that probabilistic programming uh, subfield to uh, work with existing simulators in physical sciences. So we have a method to like uh, combine these two things together. So uh, so that's that's the subject of the talk. So a little bit about me. I think I don't need this anymore. So this was all covered. One thing I can mention is like so there is a uh, there is a nice uh, effort for uh, like bringing machine learning and physical science people together. I don't know if people heard about this. I see in the names uh, joined here, uh, some people who already participated in this. So there is something called the Frontier Development Lab, the, the thing on the bottom left. So if you haven't heard about that, I think you would be interested in checking that because it's like, a, um, it's, it's something like a summer school. It, it runs for two months every year. And it is the US and European versions. And the European version is hosted in Oxford, like officially by the university. And this is specifically about bringing machine learning people and uh, physical science people together to work on well-defined projects. That's uh, mostly about uh, space sciences. So except that everything was covered by Philip brilliantly. So I'm going to skip this. Um, so, um, yeah, so the subject is simulation, and I think it's well known to uh, the people in this call that simulation is essential, and uh, in many fields, in many subfields in physical sciences. This ranges in scale from uh, particle physics to material design to uh, climate science, all the way to cosmology. Like at all scales, people uh, do many things with simulation. Uh, so uh, the the interesting thing in this work is. Uh, we, we have some infrastructure that allows you to take existing simulations and treat these existing simulations as probabilistic programs so that you can bring in uh, the tools of probabilistic programming and probabilistic machine learning to bear on your existing uh, simulators in physical sciences if you have such simulators. Um, so uh, I'm going to introduce uh, like some uh, high level uh, concepts before telling you how this thing works in practice. So a simulator uh, is like, is a piece of software. It, it takes some inputs, it gives you some outputs. So you give it some parameters or some inputs and you get some like simulated data out of it. So you, and these things in many cases, especially in physical sciences, they model some uh, system the, and the forward evolution of, of this uh, system in time. Like, so this arrow, 
of running the simulator, uh, most of the times coincides with the time uh, arrow of time. And uh, so you can run this forward and you can simulate for the forward evolution of a system. And you can generate samples of simulated uh, like states of the system or simulated data. So this is useful uh, by itself for uh, some fields like uh, climate science, maybe you want to do uh, climate projections, flood models or um, e economics models and things like that. So you, there are fields where uh, forward runs of a simulator is uh, already useful. And there is also the other possibility. Uh, so in many scientific uh, settings, well, what people want to do is going in the other direction. And this is what we call uh, inference, or this is what we call inverting the simulator. So somebody gives you instances of data uh, that corresponds to the output of the simulator. And you are uh, supposed to find the parameters uh, that can produce or explain your observed data. So it's an inverse problem. And inverse problems are most of the times uh, difficult. And uh, they require um, manual process and lots of compute computational uh, resources to, to solve. Uh, so there are some examples here. For example, in uh, uh, genomics, people have uh, like models of gene networks that can simulate uh, gene expression data. So you can get actual gene expression data from a, uh, from some instrument, and you are trying to infer what is the network uh, that causes this type of gene expression uh, data that you observed. Or in seismology, like there are fairly uh, good models that simulate uh, the propagation of waves through like the crust of the uh, planet. And so you can have these forward simulations. And uh, given some seismometer readings, you are supposed to determine earthquake characteristics or location and other things that people do in uh, seismology and earth sciences. Uh, and in the last example, so this is the actual uh, example that brought me in uh, basically to like a, applying probabilistic programming to science is particle physics. So in particle physics, people have uh, fairly large scale simulators uh, that simulate basically um, many of the uh, things that are going on in uh, particle accelerators and detectors. Uh, so you want to like get some particle detector readings, for example, and you want to uh, perform event analysis or uh, even like new discoveries or like uh, confirmations of uh, uh, theoretical expectations and like the things like that. But most of these uh, classify as an uh, inverse problem given some uh, existing forward simulator. So, so that's the simulation uh, part. So if we come to probabilistic programming, it's a, basically it's a machine learning framework that allows you to uh, write programs that define probability models. So you might be familiar with uh, uh, probabilistic graphical models where you uh, construct some graph structure that defines uh, random variables and their conditional dependencies structures, the causality relationships, and like you can do Bayesian inference in this if you heard about that. So probabilistic programming is a, like a generalization of that. Uh, it allows you to take a, a regular uh, general purpose programming language, let's say like C, Python, or some, some programming language that uh, that has some uh, features like statements that allow you to define uh, probabilistic relationships. Uh, so using this programming languages, you can, you can write probabilistic models. And the other uh, part is uh, these systems, they, uh, they include automated Bayesian inference engines. So when you define your model, the system has the capability of automatically doing inference for you. That's like a very important thing. This is a distinction between uh, model definition and inference. So inference is in, like in theory and like the, the, the aspiration of the probabilistic community is that if somebody defines the model in this programming language, we, we will be able to do automated Bayesian inference in that. So you are just supposed to say, these are my random variables. This one is uh, observable, the rest are latent. And uh, given an instance of my observed variable, what, are, what is the posterior distribution over the rest of the latents? And the system is supposed to give that to you without you even like thinking about the uh, inference algorithm. So it's supposed to be automatic. And uh, you might have heard uh, uh, like examples of such systems. So the, the here below, uh, there's Pyro, there's Edward and Stan. I think Stan is uh, 
uh, kind of uh, known in some uh, scientific communities. And Pyro is uh, currently the, uh, I think, I mean, it's, it's gaining uh, traction. So Pyro is uh, PyTorch based, if you heard about that. So the, the situation with the probabilistic programming community is that uh, the applications have been limited to toy and small scale problems. And there are some reasons for this. Uh, one reason is like probabilistic programming is uh, most of the times very uh, computation intensive. But the other thing is uh, using probabilistic programming systems requires you to implement a model from scratch in the chosen language. So let's say you want to implement a, uh, like you want to solve a problem with Pyro or Stan. You are supposed to learn Pyro or Stan and from scratch, implement your model in this language and in order to like do inference, Bayesian inference in your problem. So this is applicable for like some like exploratory or like uh, like prototype writing stage, but you cannot expect, for example, the particle physics community to take uh, some uh, fairly large simulator like Sharpa and implement it from scratch in one of these languages in order to do Bayesian inference with the particle physics data. So, so that's uh, that's one limiting factor. So nobody, like, not everybody has the uh, resources or like interest or time to implement everything from scratch in a probabilistic programming system. So the the idea in this work is that uh, you don't need to do that. So uh, so there is the, the insight is this. So many simulators are stochastic, and they already define probability models, even when the people who wrote the simulator didn't. Uh, think about it that way. Uh, so if a simulator is stochastic, uh, if it's doing uh, random number sam sampling inside the simulator, it's already uh, fairly similar to a probabilistic program. So there is some random sampling happening. And you can you can treat that as a as something that defines a prior distribution by like sampling uh, some randomness through the like uh, execution of the simulator. So and in most instances in the science uh, com community, we have access to the source code of the simulators. So the simulator is not really a black box. We know what's going on inside the simulator. We know where, the, we know the places where these random samples are uh, taken. So simulators can be uh, seen as probabilistic programs if you have the mach machinery and the, like the infrastructure to uh, treat them as uh, probabilistic programs. So I'm I'm going to explain how we do that. So so we, we just need to the, the inter infrastructure to execute existing simulators as probabilistic programs. Uh, so so uh, we've been developing a new uh, Python library. It's called PyProb. Uh, so this is specifically uh, designed for working with existing simulators in any language. The the system PyProb and the uh, the machine learning like uh, tensor framework PyTorch, it's built on. They are in Python, but they, this system has the capability of like being connected to any uh, simulator in any existing programming language. So there is like a separation between the uh, probabilistic programming and the inference part and the model part. I'm going to explain how that works. But so the summary is like you can you can take PyProb, you can take uh, an existing simulator in your field. You need to do some bit of work to combine. Uh, these two pieces by uh, directing the random number sampling in your simulator to PyProb. Other than that, you can completely keep your code base uh, untouched and you can treat your simulator as a probabilistic program. Uh, so this is uh, like, so that was like a high level description. Uh, so in practice, this is uh, what is happening. So let's say you have your simulator. Uh, you So the thing works by uh, running the simulator forward, like that's the only thing you can do by the way in, with the simulator, you can just run it forward. So you run it forward. As you are running it uh, as a side effect, you are supposed to catch all the random choices in the simulator. So you can also call this like hijacking all the uh, calls to the random number generator in the system. Let's say you have a C++ simulator. There are places where you get like a, a random number from the continuous uniform distribution, like a random uniform random number between zero and one. So we are supposed to catch that. Uh, by catch that, I mean like in the C++ side, when somebody wants this random number, we are supposed to know that this, this request happened. We are supposed to return the random number. But in addition to this, like in addition to 
providing the random number, we are supposed to also let the probabilistic programming system know that this happened. This happened at this point in execution. Like, like we need to be able to record uh, all the random number calls during the execution, like one forward execution of the simulator. And this is what we call an execution trace. So uh, here I'm I'm trying to show that in like it's a sequence of these like uh, nodes. So this is you, you start from a location and this is the end. And so with this color orange, I'm uh, representing. I'm going to represent in the upcoming slides the the data you are simulating. So in most of the cases, the data that you are simulating is like a the, either the last thing or like very close to the last part of the simulation, because like most of the simulators are written in a way that you, you simulate some data in the end. Uh, so uh, so re for recording these execution traces, there is an execution protocol. So we call this a PPX, Probabilistic Programming Execution Protocol. And this is based on uh, Google flat buffers. If people heard about protobuf, and these like serialization uh, libraries. So there is a way of, uh, so there is existing uh, low level libraries that allow you to uh, basically exchange data between uh, different pro programming languages and different, different runtime environments. So for example, like currently this thing supports all these languages that you can see here and like many more. So, so we provide that. And in addition to that, we have a, uh, we have the uh, capability of, actually it's more than a capability, it's a requirement. So for recording these execution traces, we need to be able to uniquely label each choice of these random numbers at runtime. And these things are called addresses. You can uh, treat, you can think about them as like uh, unique labels of like identifying random variables in, inside the uh, execution of the program. It's a bit more complicated than uh, just uh, the locations in the source code. like. This is the source code file. This is the line number. There's a, like a random number uh, sampling statement. It's more complicated than that. It's more related with the runtime behavior. For example, we treat, uh, I'm going into too much detail here, but like, so we, we treat the, the same random number called in the code can have different addresses according to where like the actual like sampling originates from. So you can have a function inside the function. You can have a random number call according to which other function ended up calling this function, you can have different addresses. So this is actually like a difficult and uh, uh, not so straightforward to explain. Like this is like the, some of the ugly details behind the scenes about probabilistic programming. So, but like, just remember there's like a unique label we assign to each random number draw in the, uh, in the stochastic simulator. And these things correspond to uh, prior distributions and they correspond to random variables, like implicitly defined by, by the people who wrote the code base. So, so once you have this capability of like uh, running forward your simulation and uh, recording the execution trace as a side effect, uh, the only remaining bit in order to do probabilistic programming or like Bayesian inference is the conditioning. So conditioning is in the simplest terms, it's a comparison of your uh, simulated data and the observed data given to you. So at runtime, like at test time, somebody gives you an instance of observed data, just that data. And you have a piece of simulator pipeline that is, a, that is capable of simulating data that is in the same domain, like in the same shape and all the characteristics of your observed data, but it's simulated data. So you need to be able to uh, compare simulated data, data instances and your observed data and uh, make a judgment of how similar these things are. Like that's the high level this, the definition. Uh, so by doing this, uh, you are able to approximate the distribution of parameters that can produce the observed data or explain the observed data. And you can do this by, um, I mean, in universal probabilistic programming, like with this general purpose programming uh, model, the one way of doing that is with uh, using uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. So it's uh, basically uh, sampling based inference algorithms that allow you to uh, run the simulator many times. Uh, computer likelihood, uh, we are going to cover that, and like get, get the posterior distribution uh, basically by sampling uh, and running the simulator many times. Uh, so there is one problem that comes from this. So it, this, this uh, until here things work well and everything is good. It's a good idea. 
so it comes with so if if you have a simulator that is like a large scale significant simulator like for example sharpa i'm going to show you we use sharpa in this uh, initial work these simulators are so big like if you treat them as probabilistic models you end up with probability models that nobody in the probabilistic community even attempted to run so they they correspond to giant probability models uh, so you need to run the simulator up to millions of times simulator execution is sequential inference is sequential within each mcmc chain there are things like burning and autocorrelation and other things so these things are very very difficult to uh, like handle as probability models so there are uh, techniques uh, thankfully in the probabilistic programming community already like people worked on including uh, myself and collaborators so there are technique, techniques called amortized inference. So there is a way of making use of some uh, deep learning type of stuff to make inference go faster. There's like a high level summary of amortized inference. So amortized inference, the name comes from uh, like uh, doing something uh, before inference that is very costly. Uh, that something is training some deep learning model like from your simulator data. Uh, once you train that, like once you finish that very costly phase, you can use the result of that costly training phase to do very, very fast uh, affordable inference at runtime. So, and do you amortize the cost of like uh, training that uh, infrastructure basically. So the amortized inference uh, names come from that. Uh, so the, 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 like the following slides is, uh, basically uh, explaining uh, some details about this. So there are uh, two phases of this amortized inference idea. Uh, so this is actually what we did with the uh, physics simulator. So basically the, the, the first one is training. So in the training phase, you do some data generation. So you have like many instances of your simulator, like these boxes here. You can run them in parallel. You can, like every time you run it, it, it simulates a separate event, like stochastically. And you uh, record these execution traces. So you can like uh, create a, a data set of execution traces from the simulator. And these things can be like millions of executions. So this is basically a recording of the, your simulator's behavior. And like the more you record, the more you capture about the like the stochastic behavior and the variance and the range of things you can expect from the simulator code base. So once you have the uh, uh, data set, you can do the training phase. And in the training, I don't have time to go into detail about the, like the network architecture and like deep learning details here. But so you can see that I use colors here to represent, and I hope you can see that uh, I know there are colorblind people. Uh, so please let me know if these things look the same to you. I hope not. So in the execution trace, so the, the last thing that are like colored orange, they represent data. And the other uh, gray things, they are like latents, let's say. So in the training phase, I, you might notice that I switch the order. So you take the last part, which is the data. You make the, that the input to the neural network. And you expect the neural network to predict the rest of the, like, the random variables conditioned on data. So this is like where the inversion happens in the amortized inference part. So by doing that, by training this neural network and the training can be also distributed like using uh, like distributed training uh, uh, methods that people develop in the uh, machine learning community. So basically you train a, like a recurrent neural network that takes the, uh, for each execution trace, uh, it sees the final output of the execution and tries to predict the rest of the stuff uh, from this final output. By doing that, like this, this is extremely costly, by the way, for a significant like large scale simulator. Uh, so once you are finished with that, you can just discard this thing that, that happened and just keep your trained neural network. And, uh, oh, this is the place where I noticed I already had these things in the bullet point, but so I think I covered the same thing. So, so the neural network learns all the random choices. This is what I was saying. And there are also like interesting details, like this is a dynamic neural network because uh, the one thing I like forgot to mention is like, if you have a real world uh, simulator, the simulator, every time you run the simulator, the simulator can make different choices and it can create execution traces of different lengths. So this is completely open-ended. So one time you can run the simulator, it can maybe sample like 
thousand random choice, like thousand latent variables, uh, simulate an event. The next time you run it, it can just do 10 samples. The next time you run it, it can do a million samples. So all these traces can be of different length and they are in, uh, of different length in practice. So the neural network needs to adapt to this and it needs to also account for like the, the, uh, the labels or identities of the random numbers. So it, the neural network is like the dynamic components. So it is like a LSTM or a recurrent neural network backbone. To this, like we attach different pieces that are created on the flight during training is the network sees some uh, simulator piece or behavior for the first time. So I'm going into too much detail. Like this is not a part of this work, but if people are interested in those details, I'm, I, I will be happy to talk about that. So this is a neural network that grows in size as you, you keep training it. It's that type of interesting neural network. So it's not like a fixed uh, architecture. So this is extremely costly, but uh, you have to do it only once for a given simulator, okay? So when you do that, uh, you are left with this uh, trained neural network. You can discard all this stuff and you can do inference in a uh, fast, reliable way. That's the whole idea of this amortized inference setting. So you, you have your trained neural network, you have your observed data. Somebody gives you like a new, new data instance that was not in your training data. So the inference uh, works by uh, you, like running uh, many instances of this neural network, giving them the same uh, new observed data is input and networks, they uh, they have like their ideas about like what needs to happen inside the simulator, like in the, in the places where we do random sampling to make it produce uh, traces that have outputs that look similar to your observed data. So the, basically the, the trained neural network learns to guide the random choices in the simulator in order to make it produce uh, data that looks like that looks similar to your observed data. And the similarity uh, comparison I keep referring to is uh, done by uh, a likelihood uh, function. So I, I, didn't, uh, I, I didn't explain that in technical terms for people interested in Bayesian uh, inference. Uh, so basically this is, you have your network, you have your observed data. Uh, I hear the background noise. Uh, maybe this was the intention, okay. Uh, yeah, so, so this, can I yeah, ask um, yeah. the the traces of the like the random numbers and their locations? Is that right? Yes, they are. Yeah. Uh, and so what you're doing is you're reproducing the traces, but does that guarantee that you're reproducing the parameters? Uh, so actually, like, uh, so it's not reproducing. Actually, at the uh, inference time, we are running the simulator from scratch. So uh, so you start running the simulator like you do normally, but this time when you run the simulator, instead of using the prior distributions encoded in the simulator, you go to the neural network. Every time the simulator asks for a random number, we go to the neural network. We ask the neural network, what do you want to give to the simulator? So the neural network makes the decision about which random number to return. This is a bit interesting. So in machine learning terms, this is called the proposal distribution. Instead of the prior, that is like the in the original simulator source code, the prior distributions, we have a proposal defined by the neural network. So it, it you, you don't reproduce a trace. You run a completely new trace from scratch, guided by the knowledge of like the, this network having seen the data. Uh, I don't know if that answered the question. Nearly, but I think what, yeah. what Louis wanted to know is yeah. where, who has set the parameters of the simulator? Because your neural yes. network hasn't touched the parameters and we are after the parameters in the end. Uh, okay, so, the par the, so these things will be like uh, the parameters. So these things will be, so you, you make that definition. Uh, in the beginning, when you set up the, the training, you make a definition of uh, what are your latent variables. So the, any parameters that you would like to infer with this uh, framework, they need to be treated as latent variables. Yeah. And like you get posterior distributions over these latent variables in the end. So so basically, and it happens by like uh, like sam a sampling based inference algorithm. So so I, I don't but know if I have slides for yeah. So the neural network tells the simulator both yeah. the starting parameters, so the latent variables, yes, and the simulator 
asks the neural network every time it has a new call stack which ends up in a random number variable call exactly it asks the simulator here is my call stack which random number should i use next yes yes uh okay. which run no not which random number actually like i think i should just uh, quickly show you some more informative thing okay so we can do that very quickly because i know okay. i'm in my archive okay. account uh, so, because there is like a figure that answers this question very well. So, let's do that. Uh, uh, it's in this paper. The thing is like this talk was prepared in a very high level way without going into the actual details, but and maybe this is not the community for like the high level. Maybe I should go low level. So, this is what happens. I don't know if you can see this figure now. Yeah, can you make it a bit bigger? Yeah, can you see it? There we go. Yeah. OK, so like this is the simulator part. The simulator part just like doesn't change, OK? It's like the, the way people coded it. So it always starts from the same location. There is no choice. Like the, when you run the program, it always has a starting point, like entry point. You go like in, until you have any stochasticity, you keep running it. Like this is the deterministic part. Anything can happen in this meantime. We don't know it. We don't have access to deterministic parts. When the simulator comes to a stochastic part, when it needs a random number, this location, this is the point where the simulator asks for a random number in the code base. Let's say you are in C++, it goes to the random number generator, wants a random number. There, we, we masquerade or like we, we uh, show ourselves as the random number generator. The simulator thinks that we are the random number generator, asks for a random number from the function we define. Then we return the random number immediately. I mean, like we don't return it immediately. Okay, let me rephrase that. So we communicate to the machine learning side. We say, okay, we are at this address. We need this type of random number from this type of distribution. These are the parameters of the distribution. Uh, give us the random number. So the machine learning side produces that random number or anything that it wants to produce and returns the number and we give it to the simulator and the simulator is happy. It keeps doing this until the end, okay? So the thing that happens in the uh, machine learning side, it can be two things. If we are in like prior execution, it can just actually sample from the prior distribution like that the, the request was containing. Like let's say somebody asks a um, number from the no, like standard normal distribution, it, it just returns that. But if we are in the inference part with the amortized inference and there's a neural network on the machine learning side, at this point, we go to the neural network, we say, we give this like, uh, data is the input. We say there is like a random number. The prior was this, and this is the location. Based on your training experience, what what should be what should we return to the other side? So the neural network uh, creates the random number and returns it over the protocol. Like from the simulator's point of view, the simulator like does nothing changes for the simulator. So in effect, by doing this, like we are intelligently uh, controlling the numbers returned to the simulator. And I think I'm coming to the part where I'm actually going to answer your question. <laughs> so the, 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 the decisions of like which random number to sample next is always in the simulator. So the simulator makes that decision. So the simulator is stochastic. So in, rea in reality, like some, according to what you ended up sampling here, you can make different choices in, inside the simulator. Like there can be an if statement, there can be like function calls, like choices that the, depend on the actual sampled value, right? So these things uh, stay the same. So what we like, what we do is just like, uh, like influence the returned numbers to the simulator. Everything else stays in the simulator, like including the decision of like uh, which order t these things can go. Like the structure remains the same. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope that answer. Like, like yes, yes. Are, okay. That was All very right. clear. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the thing is, like, there are so many details in this work. It's really difficult to keep, like, uh, uh, fill everything in, into one talk. Like, it's really, really, like, detailed. There are a lot of things going on uh, underneath. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, so there is another high-level, like, description of this. Like, uh, this was actually uh, suggested by the particle physics collaborators to, like, explain what's going on. So it's like a puppet master. This thing is representing that. The, the, the part on the top is the machine learning or probabilistic programming system. The thing in the bottom is the simulator. 
basically the machine learning system has the full control of like the stochastic choices inside the simulator. And like basically we are puppeteering the simulator to make it uh, do things that we'd like it to do. And if you have this capability, you can uh, do Bayesian inference with this, uh, like with this pro uh, proposal distributions and inference engines and like a lot of things that I don't have time to cover here by default. Uh, so yeah, there are some like technical uh, details of how this thing works. I already mentioned the execution protocol. This is the piece that uh, provides the connection between the machine learning part and the, the domain simulation part. And yeah, basically that's all. Uh, yeah, so all this work started as a uh, collaboration. It's a fairly large scale collaboration by machine learning standards. And I know it's a fairly small uh, collaboration in terms of maybe particle physics standards, but like, so we had this group, but we have three types of people. We have machine learning people like myself. We have high performance computing people like at uh, Lawrence Berkeley lab, like they provide the compute cap cap uh, capacity. We had the company represented because the simulator we were using was running so slow, we need to make it faster. So Intel was helping that. And we had our like, uh, uh, particle physics collaborators. Basically, they set up the particle physics uh, like problem in the simulator code base, and we work with it to like develop all this infrastructure that allowed us to uh, like treat the simulator as a probabilistic program. And in doing that, we actually constructed the tools that allow you to like treat other simulators as uh, in the same way and do uh, like the same basically for other domains or other other applications. So, and the collaboration is called Etalumis. So it's like, uh, it's simulate uh, spelled backwards. So it's like, we are inverting simulators. It's like a interesting name. I hope you find it interesting. Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. So that's where the name comes from. Uh, sometimes I forget to mention that. Uh, yeah, so in the, so I think this is the first time in this talk that I'm actually showing some uh, like Bayesian notation. So this is like a repetition of what we did for the uh, particle physics case. So this uh, horizontal line here is like dividing uh, the simulation word on the top from the real word in the bottom, let's say. And in the simulation part, we have like a forward simulation. We have a, a Sharpa simulator and you can have Giant for, so these things simulate the standard model to some degree uh, as far as I know, and like the particle physics detector, let's say. So you have a simulator pipeline. Every time you run this, it generates like a, random event as realistically as possible, gives you simulated uh, particle physics like detector data. So we have this pipeline. This this thing uh, corresponds to prior distribution or like a joint prior. So in the uh, probabilistic programming community, the convention is to use Y to refer to data and X for like referring to latents. So these like multiple latents together. So this you can th think these things are like multiple uh, latents and even multiple data. So you have a prior and you have a likelihood. So the prior is over your latents. So these things can be the parameters that you were asking, or it can be other things like what people call parameter uh, changes actually from uh, field to field a bit. Uh, you can also have nuisance param uh, parameters or nuisance variables. Like you don't really care about the uh, posteriors over those or like there are like, it's not so straightforward what you want to infer. Uh, but at the end of the day, anything you want to infer, or anything you are interested uh, having a posterior over needs to be like defined, okay? So you, you say, I want this and this and this variables, I care about them. And you get, uh, you, you have prior distributions over these, okay, defined by the simulator. And you have a likelihood function. So you, you have this pipeline and like the, the, the whole intention is at uh, test time, somebody is going to give you an observed data you will have this observed statement. You will evaluate the likelihood of the observed data under the like this whole simulation pipeline. And this likelihood evaluation gives you a way of uh, approximating the posterior distribution by using this automated inference engines. And I'm, I don't have time to like cover how these inference engines work, but there are like a variety of inference engines from different families, like from MCMC, uh, importance sampling, variational inference, like there are families of inference engines that do this thing for you, uh, depending on the, the, the system. Uh, so in the particle physics case, we were uh, basically in this paper, we were working on a 
problem that was about the tau lepton decay. So this is a particle that can decay in uh, 38 uh, different ways. I think they are called channels. So this is, for example, the prior distribution over the decay channels of the tau lepton particle. And uh, so here you see some like uh, real examples of like how these uh, unique labels I was uh, talking about before. So these are, for example, so you can see, so A1 is like a short name we give to the uh, random variable that has this label. They are very long and like mm -hmm. uh, very complicated labels. Since we cannot uh, pronounce or like uh, talk about this this way, we give them like short like shorthand names. So, uh, like we assign them as they appear, uh, we assign them short names. So when we take took Sharp for simulator and run it like, for some time, we discovered uh, around 25,000 such addresses. So 25,000 unique uh, random like samples that can happen in the simulator. And we are saying at least because this is completely open-ended because it's in C++. There is no, like, we don't really know the number of latent variables in the simulator. Uh, this is what we encountered after running it millions and millions of times. And the number keeps increasing. Like, I think maybe it's asymptotically increasing towards some upper limit. But theoretically, it's unbounded. Like, there are an infinite number of latents in a uh, simulator that is implemented in a Turing complete language. So, but this like a detail. Uh, so in practice, these, like, traces that I was referring to, they look like this, for example, one trace that is the most frequent trace is like this sequence of random numbers uh, for some reason. They refer to some uh, type of uh, uh, path that you can take through the simulator to simulate an event. Like that is the most likely thing that happens to a tau lepton uh, as it's simulated in this. And the next most likely sequence is this. So this, there are like sequences of like random numbers, uh, like random, uh, random variable addresses inside the execution. And one thing to note is like, this is just a sequence of the locations and the sample uh, values in each would be different. So there is also like, the, you, this is like not accountable or, uh, I mean, all the traces of this type of this family, they will be different because they are all continuous distributions except one, I think one is con uh, uh, categorical, like a discrete distribution because we have continuous distributions in the simulator each instance of this trace, even if it has the same sequence, it will have different values. So you, I'm just trying to explain uh, how things work in practice. So uh, yeah, let's talk a bit about the inference results. Uh, I think I'm running slightly out of time. Uh, so one, uh, when we do this work, we need to uh, show several things. One of them is like, does this amortized inference idea work? Uh, the other thing is like, does your system work? So the, the way you do this in probabilistic programming is most of the times you have some like gold standard inference that is very costly. So we do some MCMC inference. So the results here are from uh, MCMC. This is extremely costly. So we got this result, for example, in this slide for like running it for 115 hours, let's say. So this is the posterior distribution over some of the latents that the physics uh, uh, partners in the collaboration cared about. So the the moment of the tau particle, uh, final state particle energies and decay channels and other things. So th these are like posterior distributions over the latents uh, for a test case that we also took from the simulator. So we run the simulator once, we record an execution trace. We just take the data out of it, simulated data. And we know the ground truth values that were sampled for given that the uh, simulated data, right? So, and these are shown as this vertical lines in this plot. And uh, we we just feed in the synthetic data to the pipeline. We run our MCMC inference and we get these dis posterior distributions. And this is like a way of testing this type of setup with synthetic data. And so you get interesting things like this multimodalities in some cases like things we discussed with the particle physics uh, people in the collaboration. So they can interpret and explain that these things make sense. Uh, so, and we like, in practice, we need to do things like a convergence uh, diagnostics for the MCMC. And you see that like it needed to like execute a million times uh, before like anything converged. We have like very large like autocorrelation numbers like to get like uh, non-correlated samples from the simulation, you need to run it 
uh, 10 to the five times. Like, so these are like very big numbers for any practical uh, use of this. Like, I mean, if you do it for like a significant event analysis, like you can afford to wait maybe a few days, but like, it's not something that you can deploy in re real time, for example, for doing something. Uh, so I think I will, uh, I will like skip step faster. Uh, actually, wait, wait. Uh, what happened here? Ah, the, the thing I forgot to mention is like, so this amortized inference, the IC, is the label we use. This inference compilation is a name for a particular type of amortized inference. So the amortized inference, like we can get the same result uh, in like 30 minutes that we got with like more than 100 hours. And actually, these plots show that I forgot to mention. So you see like uh, histograms here that show you two things the IC and RMH. So the RMH one is the MCMC. So you see that they agree. Uh, so you see that you can get the same posterior for the same observation and the same uh, prior simulation. So this is how you like uh, convince people and like yourself that the amortized inference idea works. Uh, so this is a nice good result. A an interesting thing about the amortized inference part is, is embracing the parallel. So this is uh, something uh, very important. You can run like according to the comp computational resources that you have, you can run many instances of this in parallel. Every time you run the neural network and you run the simulator with the neural network, you get a completely uncorrelated independent sample from the posterior. That's like a very, very powerful thing. And this actually allows this uh, to be like practical, uh, like in the real world. Uh, okay, so there are some other things. Like I'm, I have some like last slides that is about the other aspects of this type of uh, setup. So this thing, uh, is about, uh, okay, so we looked at these histograms. So these are just some of the latents in the simulator because, uh, I mean, they are interesting for the problem setup. Uh, but when you do this type of thing, actually you get the uh, posterior distribution over the whole latent space of the simulator. And this thing in practice has like thousands and thousands of latent variables. And if you choose to look at them, they you get this type of, uh, like grids of histograms that are fairly large, large scale. And there are a lot of things to it. Like, uh, like you can think about ways of uh, uh, like interpreting these results. So one thing that we always say is this is interpretable. This is like, because you never discard your simulator, you have like an actual model of your system which is very different from what people do in deep learning. Like you don't train a neural network like a black box that uh, does inference for you uh, over the like the uh, moment of the top particle. You can train such a thing. You can train from the same data set. You can train a neural network that takes the observation and gives you some predictions over the tau momenta. But you wouldn't have the interpretability and people have a hard time like trusting this type of things. In our case, we all our all our results always come from the simulator. We just guide the simulator, and we never discard it. And as a side effect, we have the whole picture of what happens inside the simulator. This is uh, this is very good when we, we can develop the tools to aid such things. So we are also trying this type of things. Uh, for example, the the figure on the right hand side is so these nodes in this figure in this graph they are random uh, variables and you can see there are like these looping structures in the in the graph. They are actually corresponding uh, to loops in the uh, simulator code base. That's like an interesting coincidence in two domains. So the thing is, uh, you can see that, for example, in this loop, uh, you are sampling two things all the time, like this sample, 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 and you make a decision, is it good enough? No, then you sample, 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 is it good enough? No. So this is like a rejection sampling loop for people who are familiar with the code base. So you keep sampling something until the condition a condition is satisfied. And you, you do that through this loop and you come back and when you accept the sample, you, you keep going. So this the, the central part of this like a crazy figure is like the, the main code base. And I can see like a tiny bit of blue note here that is the data. So this is like a really complicated thing to look at, okay? And uh, yeah, we also have some like uh, running jokes because we show uh, thousands of histograms together and people sometimes uh, make jokes about that. But so there are ways of uh, simplifying these pictures. Uh, I don't uh, have time to go into detail about that, but like, so you can 
just remember like this the same picture can be also looked at in a simplified way by uh, uh, omitting some information. So for example, the same address can be called many times in a for loop. Let's say you have a for loop that calls the same random number a thousand times. We just have a way of de uh, determining that from the address label. And we just uh, use one node in the graph uh, to that sum for the sample instead of like creating thousand nodes. So when, when we do this type of things, uh, we can end up with this type of more uh, more interpretable uh, graphs. And so, for example, we, this graph is from uh, taking the 10 most frequent uh, types of simulation executions. And this is like the start. Everything starts the same. Uh, everything actually ends up sampling the same sequence of random numbers until this point at A26, where you can do multiple things. You can either go to the next address or like A9, the thing, or you can come to yourself, like you can end up sampling this thing again. So with some like frequencies, you can also measure this like or, or like like record these frequencies by running the simulator many times and like getting the statistics. So you have some sort of uh, structure that tells you the stochastic, uh, like the actually the, the structure of the probabilistic model that is uh, de defined by the simulator code base. And the blue things in the end, they uh, refer to uh, parts where we have the likelihood distribution. So you can just see, think that the last blue one is the simulated data. An interesting thing that happens is, uh, so actually this is how the, the addresses look like. So the thing we call A1 is actually this. And someone who knows Sherpa, like from the particle physics community, they can understand. Uh, they say, okay, this is a gener event generation. I generate this type of event. I have a hadron decay event, and I ended up asking for a uniform random number. So you, there's a story here that you can interpret. And actually, uh, we have people in the collaboration who want to like uh, create tools that work with this like explanations. Uh, so these are interpretable. So once you know how to read these things, you can have a picture of, okay, this is where we, what we do. We start. We sample the uh, values for the uh, momenta. This is where we define the uh, decay channel. This is where we do some rejection sampling. This is the calorimeter for the detector, for example. And the interesting thing is if we take into account 25 most frequent trace types instead of the 10, we keep seeing, a, like we keep uh, refining like the resolution of the detail in this plot because we keep discovering less likely behaviors that fills in the picture. Like you, you have some picture appearing uh, that gives you more and more detail about the internals of the simulator uh, structure as you take more, like as as you construct these graphs with more like data. So this is how it looks like for 25 uh, most frequent trace types. Uh, this is what it looks like with 100. This is what it looks like with 250. So we have like this capability of uh really looking inside the simulator and seeing the structure inside the simulator and this is actually happening for the first time uh because the the community who wrote the simulator they didn't have this intention in mind so they they created the probability model but they never even looked at the probability model it's like an implicitly defined probability model that we are uh discovering thanks to this like uh, software infrastructure basically uh so i think this is the last slide uh yeah, so this type of thing like can lead to a lot of uh, research directions. So, uh, like this is supposed to be a list of uh, a few of those. So, I'm interested in automatic differentiation. So you can incorporate automatic differentiation into this type of protocol. Uh, you can use this uh, structure for surrogate model learning. Uh, for example, if you have this probability structure, you can construct some. Uh, interesting neural architecture that replicates the structure and learn uh, like a structured uh, deep learning model, for example. That's very interesting. Uh, these rejection sampling loops I briefly mentioned, they are very interesting and challenging. So they require their own like research from the probabilistic programming side to handle them efficiently and correctly. Uh, so there are like distributed training and inference aspects. So for example, when we run this thing, uh, on like a Lawrence Berkeley lab. We run it in a supercomputer initially uh, that was called Corey. It was like the largest scale uh, PyTorch execution on CPU. That was a bit interesting. So yeah, there are a lot of things. And the other interesting thing is that you can do the same for 
other domains and other simulations. Uh, and this is the last slide. So currently, for example, I have a collaboration with the European Space Agency. Uh, we do something similar for uh, spacecraft collision prevention. So they have uh, simulators for spacecraft in orbit, like spacecraft mainly like satellites. And so you, you have to predict like collision events. Uh, there are students in Oxford that are uh, working on epidemiology models, and this thing was uh, happening even before the uh, coronavirus pandemic. So this, we, we had some work about malaria simulation, and like there are other people working on uh, simulation of materials and things like that. So the idea is like you can, uh, when you have a simulator, don't just uh, think that, okay, it's a simulator and uh, like assume that that's the whole uh, thing you can do with that. So you can do interesting, cool stuff with your simulator in uh, machine learning and probabilistic machine learning. That's basically uh, it. And I think this is not supposed to be here. So I, I do this workshop at NERVS and this was in December. And yeah, so this was like an advertisement for that. And I hope we can have the same workshop next year. So if, we, if the workshop happens next year and if you have papers in physics and machine learning, like we would really be happy to get your papers to this workshop. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks a lot, Ganesh. That was really, right. really nice. OK, thank you. I, I'm, I'm glad like uh, you heard me. <laughs> Try. Oh, yeah, we heard you perfectly. All right. So, OK, uh, thank you. All right. OK, questions. People have any questions, please raise your hands. OK, oh, Louis. there are raised hands. OK, <laughs> there we go. Uh, so uh, in the example you had, the amortized inference uh, yeah. was like uh, 200 times faster than MCMC. Yes. And you were using MCMC to sort of validate the amortized inference. Now, yes. if other people were using it in other problems, what do you think is the uh, generalization to other cases? Does everybody have to go back to MCMC to check it? Or do you have some general belief that it's going to work for pretty well anything? Yeah, that's a very nice question. So we tested this MCMC, MCMC inference engine in the system like uh, quite extensively. Like there are unit tests with like uh, standard textbook problems. It seems to do the job. Like there are problems where you know uh, the answer analytically, there is like an analytical formula for the posterior of a given model. And you can, what I'm trying to say is like, you can test this inference engines and after a while you can trust in them and you can just say, okay, they are, they, it has been shown that this inference engine works in practice. Maybe you can then skip the MCMC inference and directly go for the amortized inference one, if you trust what we did here. Uh, but I would like, it, it, so it, from the machine learning perspective, I think you would do the MCMC first. Actually, we do that with students to make sure that we really uh, have a good model for which the posterior can be found and it makes sense. Then we convince ourselves that it's working. Then we go for the faster one after the initial uh, exercise. All right, thanks. Yep. And the, the output from uh, like the tau problem was, uh, a posterior probability distribution over all the variables of interest, I think. Exactly, yes, yes. And that, so from, uh, and the, the width of that distribution tells you the statistical uncertainties on the parameters. Yes, yes. And the systematics you have to bother about separately. Uh, so actually, I'm not quite like I don't have the background to like talk about systematics. <laughs> I I hear like the physics people talking about this a lot, but so the, the so for example, there's like this multimodality in this example, and when we talk to the physicists, they say, yeah, this completely makes sense. You can have like there is a symmetry in this direction of the momentum. It could be either this or that. So this tells you like, that, I mean, this these results give you uncertainty that is like telling you that this type of data can be produced in many ways and we don't this is the level to which we can be certain about what happened uh, that beyond that i'm a bit like uh, i lack the knowledge about systematics to talk about that uh, the question okay
Okay, Amen. Yeah. Your question. Yeah, thank you. That was really a very interesting talk, and it, it indeed does have a thousand and one possible applications. I'm, mm. I'm I'm asking about something which has nothing to do with inference or machine learning at all. All right. About your technology to instrument the executables to generate right. your your call stacks, and in particular, then generate these representations, these more compact representations yeah. of the execution uh, uh, stacks. Yeah. Is this is something in principle because everything between your nodes is deterministic. Yeah. Uh, this representation completely captures the entire execution paths of, 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 of any program. So yeah. if we were to, uh, if, if we wanted to kind of uh, analyze programs which are, which are nothing to do with simulation in this case here, um, how would we, uh, you know, how would we learn how to instrument mm -hmm. our code so that it can, in the end, give us um, diagrams like the one that you're currently showing? What okay. is it I need to do in order to instrument uh, a piece of code? It is a simulator code, but it's nothing to do with particle physics in this case. Yeah, so is it a stochastic code, for example? That's yes. very yeah, important. Yeah, it, it has, it has okay. lots of random number uh, uh, variables right. in between. Okay, so because if it's deterministic, you will end up with just like a yeah one end between one start one and end, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, so for your case, like the the, the the I mean, there's I mean, I think you already uh, know the answer. So you just need to okay. So in practice, this is what happens in the Sharpa code base. There was one single C plus plus file file that was like mm -hmm. random dot cpp or something. The, the people who designed the simulator code base made that choice. They they unified all the run like all the functions that returns like random numbers in, in, a, in a single file. So mm. our task was to just go to that file, keep all the API, like all the function signatures and everything the same without touching that. Inside each function, we redirected the random calls. So for example, it was calling the C++ standard library for some, like, I don't know, Poisson distribution or uniform or something. Yeah. We just directed that to our C++ uh, library that connects to the machine learning system over the protocol I mentioned. That was all you need to do. Uh, the simulator stays the same. The simulator is happy. Okay. We return the random number. And as a side effect, you get these plots and everything I'm, I'm showing in the talk. This is what happens. OK, so the, 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 the task would be to consolidate all of the calls to random numbers yeah. into one piece of uh, uh, you know, code that, that you can then um, instrument. Yes, I mean, even if you don't consolidate them into one uh, source code file, Small you, number. you could yeah. still do that, yeah. I mean, you need to find the place of uh, randomness in your code base and redirect all of them to the, like, to the, inter to the protocol. That's okay, all. no, yeah. thank you. That's, yeah. that's, that's quite straightforward. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Armin. Hannah, please go ahead. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you for a, a very um, interesting talk. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you, yeah, thank you. Perfect. Um, so I'm, I'm over in uh, atmospheric physics and I work on developing uh, stochastic simulators for weather forecasting in particular. Yeah. Um, and so uh, obviously a big um, a kind of important uh, thing there is is the input state. So it's an, it's an initial value problem. I didn't really notice in your uh, kind of your slide where you were talking about um, uh, kind of training the neural network. Yeah. Where the in, where a kind of initial condition would come in. Yeah. Is that? Uh, I mean, so, how does that fit? I I get the question because like I did some like oversimplification in these slides. So so if these initial conditions are like if you are after like uh, determining the initial conditions in this type of framework, you need to treat them as latent variables and you need to define prior distributions of these uh, over these uh, initial conditions. Ah, so it's not so much as so I suppose that the idea is that I, I have initial conditions, which I know, yeah. uh, and I have an observed, you know, future state, which I know, and I have my yeah. simulator, which includes draws to you know, draws uh -huh. of random numbers. And what I want to know is to, is to try and constrain the parameters which define these, you know, these, these sequences of random numbers better. So, uh, there are un you know, there are uncertain parameters in the code, which uh -huh. I would like to constrain. Um, or, yeah, sorry. Uh, or like if, 
So if you want to infer like initial conditions based on your data, that you need to have this prior distributions of, over initial conditions. If you like, uh, if you have other things that you want to this like uh, infer, you need prior distributions over this. Like because it's this Bayesian inference uh, idea that is like underpinning everything. It it doesn't work, for example, with uh, things over which you cannot define priors. I don't know if it explains it, but. Uh, and some people find this difficult. For example, in the particle physics collaboration initially, the physics people were not so easy about like selecting some arbitrary priors over some like physical uh, parameters, for example. Uh, yeah, there are this type of things. Uh, I, I, I fear that I didn't completely answer the question. I can try it again. <laughs> I think I can, I might, yeah. I can get in touch with you offline. A, yeah, of a course. quick question is uh, to follow up is whether and climate models are written in Fortran. Yeah. With that, does that sink in? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 I can imagine that. Yeah, actually, even maybe easier than some other languages we work with. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> All right. Okay. Nice. Thanks a lot. Okay, Tim, your question. Uh, yes, I was interested how you um, make the connection between actually on the slide you've got up here, slide forty-four, how you make the connection between the signatures that you have, yeah, and the variables that you've. Um, that you've got. In particular, I'm, I'm just concerned that um, you might have in some uh, um, in some simulations where um, uh, one signature can actually be used for um, different um, variables or different parts of the the model, um, depending upon the uh, interaction between the other the the other um, uh, variables. Um, so, how do you how do you take that into account? Yes, okay, this is important. And actually this is like uh, really difficult to explain in the beginning. So so these labels that this, I think you when you say signature, you refer to these labels here. And they actually like they are, they they have to be unique. Otherwise your probabilistic programming doesn't work. Like it, they have to be, uh, like they have a lot of components here. For example, this number in the end, like uh, this uh, underscore one uh, distinguishes between different times the same thing got called like in the exact like uh, sequence of function calls. It's the first time this thing was called. It, the second time we'll get another number here. It will get two if you end up calling the same thing again. And these things will be treated as completely separate random variables by the probabilistic programming system. So we don't like, uh, we, we, otherwise the inference engine doesn't work. We need to be deterministically uh, able to like reproduce a whole execution trace from scratch by just like having a dictionary of like unique labels and the value sample for those. Uh, so I think that the answer is like, we ensure that uh, one name refers to only one unique thing in the execution. And there is never the uh, like degeneracy that you were referring to. Okay, I think I understand that. So yeah. how do you then link these to a particular variable? Uh, so we, we basically, uh, as like, so the, the thing we start with are these labels, and we make the choice of like, uh, calling these things uh, random variables, because this is all we have. So we, we call, uh, like, we treat each uh, unique label that we discovered in the simulation execution we, we, we call them random variables. We make that choice of like telling, okay, this is a random variable. Uh, so does it answer the question? I, I guess maybe not. Um, but well, this, you, you, this, you later on, you, you showed that uh, you could say, you could point at one and said, that's PX and that's PY yes, and that's PZ. Yes, yes. How do you know that that one oh, is okay. PX and so on? Okay, for example, so maybe I can try to, exp so, Everything starts with forward, so that's like the entry point. So you, this is actually like a uh, series of stacks, like stack frames in C++ that tells you a history of all the way from the beginning of the execution of the program until the point where you requested the random sample. This tells you the story of what happened, like a series of function calls. The main forward function called another function it called another function, it's called another function, all this series of things happened. And in the end, you ask for a categorical. So um, I'm sorry, this is blocking that. So it's a categorical distribution 
it has 38 categories. It's like a discrete distribution. And this is the first time we call this. And this 38 is like uh, giving you an idea that, oh, this is maybe the point where we are sampling the decay channel. And when you actually work with a collaborator who is really familiar with the code base, uh, they can read these things and they can see, okay, I know this part of the simulator. This is the part where we call uh, the, this is where we construct the decay table. And like, so you can look at these things and interpret and actually uh, locate the place in the code base, uh, which was responsible for this uh, label at runtime. So basically we, we, uh, we have a way of understanding just by looking at these things, like uh, what these things are doing. Not for all of them, but like for the main parts, yes. Another thing is like uh, for this problem, like we set it up such that uh, when you run the C++ simulator, C++ simulator, the first things that happen are always like you sample the, the momenta of the particle, like X, Y, Z. There are some other things and you sample the decay channel. So you always start all simulations with these choices of momenta and the decay channel and the rest uh, follows from that like the stochasticity starts after so we, we we know about the problem structure uh i, I hope that uh, answers a bit <laughs> yeah thanks it's a, yeah. so it's basically a, a deep knowledge of the yes. particular simulator yes exactly how it yeah. works and um, you allow you to kind of tease out this information exactly okay. and and you need access to someone who really knows the simulator yes yeah yeah okay thanks yeah all right Nice. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Gunish, again. If there are no more questions, then that is the end of today. All right. Thanks to everybody and see you next week. All right. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you very much. <laughs>